thank you all for coming here. I want to introduce a couple of my colleagues who are here. Ed Bugnosen, just here in the corner. Oh, uh, is that you, Scott? Yes. Yeah, two. Uh, and then Sandra there. So. <laughs> so, right. You'll always find new ways of putting me off. Uh, so, Regency Minds is an AIM listed company. I'm Andrew Bell, and I am uh, chief executive of it. Here is uh, a brief description. As you see, we have three divisions lateritic nickel and cobalt, nickel and copper in Australia, and mining finance and technology. We started off thinking we'd be more or less balanced between nickel and copper. We seem to be more in the direction of nickel at the moment, but that's not necessarily something that will always persist. We've got a share price of 4.4 pence, market capitalization of 26 million, and 590 million shares in issue. This is the share price. Uh, as you can see here, the price was in what you might describe as an upward trend. And from here, it's been in what my old Japanese broker friends many years ago used to call a sideways trend. <laughs> this is the uh, Papua New Guinea. And you see in the middle of it there, the black square, the Mambare Plateau in Oro province is the site of our uh, nickel lateritic project. That's nickel cobalt uh, in laterites. And uh, you go down to Oro Bay through Popondetta on the coast. And the other way, you can see Port Moresby. And the old maps, in fact, the new maps, show a road going all the way through. If there are any Australians present, they'll know that those maps are misleading and that what shows as a road is in fact some pretty tough hiking, which the Japanese discovered when they landed on the east coast there, thought they'd go through to Port Moresby and take Australia in the rear the way they'd taken Singapore and found themselves in hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the mountains there with the Australians, uh, which is why the eastern edge of that, just outside where we are, uh, is in fact a Australian war memorial and the Australians go there every year and celebrate what they regard as one of their most important victories. This is the Mambari Plateau. It's about 20 kilometers by 7 kilometers, so it's extremely large. And it's therefore a very large envelope, potentially containing nickel. Here is uh, a exaggerated vertical picture of it, showing the different rock types. And you can find this presentation on our website. So if you can't see clearly from where you're sitting, you will be there. Uh, we have formed with this uh, deposit a joint venture with a company called Direct Nickel. And some of you here may have geological knowledge, some may not. So would you mind if I ask you one or two simple questions? The first is, do, you, do, do people here know the size of the nickel market annually? Any guesses? Big. <laughs> okay. In terms of money. Up about $35 billion a year. So that's the size of it. And how, do people know how much nickel goes into stainless steel? What percentage? Two thirds. So more than 66% of nickel mined is actually going into stainless steel. And the use of that is obviously to prevent steel corroding where it's exposed to water. And you all know the kind of things that have stainless steel in them. More or less anything that you plug into a plug and an awful lot of things you put petrol into and other things beside. So when people move from countrysides to towns, as for example, hundreds of billions of people are doing in China and India and other countries at the moment, they immediately <coughs> become customers for stainless steel goods. And stainless steel, therefore nickel, uh, is to a very large extent, therefore, a metal that is linked to consumer demand, urbanization, and growing middle class standards in a way that some other metals that may have more industrial uses may not be. And do people also know where most nickel comes from? Sulfide sources or laterite sources? 
Well, the great majority of production is from sulfides at the moment, but probably up to three quarters of the world's reserves of nickel are held in laterites in the tropics. And the sulfides were probably all created in the first half of the Earth's existence. Geologists here will correct me, I'm sure, if I say anything wrong. And they're getting increasingly difficult to find. And with the greater demand for nickel, for stainless steel and other uses, you're going to have to use the laterites. And laterites, because the nickel is caught in clay uh, and is in fairly flat-lying deposits, usually near surface, much lower grade, the key to them is how do you extract the nickel from the clay? Because clay is messy, sticky material, and you have to get an awful lot of it separated from the nickel to make it work. So the key to developing lateritic nickels is the metallurgy. It's the chemistry. It's separating it. And this has always been the difficulty. So we knew we had one thing, which is we knew we had a potentially world-class deposit in terms of size and reasonable in terms of grade and fairly accessible. But in order to be sure that we could get a valuation on this, we had to uh, find a way to ally ourselves with people who had better metallurgy, a better mousetrap for getting this out. Because at the moment, and historically, the, uh, the, there are two factors which would play against laterating nickel. The first is that the price cycle in nickel has always been quite extreme. There are very low lows and very high highs. In the bottom parts of the cycle, nickel laterites have not been competitive because they are not as cheap to produce historically as some nickel sulfides. And the second uh, thing that has uh, made it difficult to work with nickel laterites in the past has been that the, uh, the processes available for extracting them have been generally either inefficient or be very capital intensive and requiring large initial outlay. So we thought the, the way, uh, and as a result of this, the valuation put per pound in the ground on lateritic nickel is a fraction of that put on sulfide nickel. So in order to maximize the value of this for shareholders, we knew the key issue we had to solve was that of metallurgy. But if we could ally a good, a good process with our potential deposit, our size of resource, then we could create something very valuable. And people who had that kind of technology might find us attractive because we'd make it easy to work with them. We would bend over backwards to do it. And we had something of sufficient scale to be able to create a really big story. So we looked around and we decided the best technology there was direct nickels technology. And there are many reasons for this, and you can find them on the Direct Nickel website, or you can ring me afterwards, all kinds of things. Two years ago, nobody necessarily would have agreed. But if you look at Citi's recent research on the nickel industry, which goes in, which is quite a substantial thick piece of work, and also goes into all the technologies, you will see that this technology comes out best from their appraisal. And there's only one way to play this technology at the moment, only one listed vehicle, and only one group that's in there, and that's us. So we have a joint venture uh, operating committee. We're doing two things this year. Direct Nickel is doing its demonstration plant to demonstrate the technology's work works, and that will be done in Perth in Western Australia. It'll take about three months operation. One month after that, we'll have the results. The other thing we're doing is our joint venture is doing the second drill program and ground penetrating radar at Mambare. And Ed is on that committee, and they meet weekly and uh, plan everything for the drill program starting in April. This is the key features of that joint venture, and you'll see all this later because there's another slide, uh, which I'm showing you some of the direct ni nickel slides that they produced this year at Mines and Money, this week at Mines and Money Hong Kong. We haven't had time to integrate that presentation. Uh, into ours fully, because it's only being given this week, but I did attach at the end of this some of the slides. Uh, but the key things here is this is the only technology able to process both limonite and saprolite, that it is scalable, that it uses normal materials, that therefore it's not high capital cost, cost of entry, and that the operating cost will put it in the lowest quartile of producers. So for the first time, 
nickel laterites will be competitive with sulfites. The main technology used at the moment that people know about that also extracts a very high percentage of the nickel is high pressure acid leaching. And some of the difficulties with this are stated here and a very, very quick description of how the direct nickel technology arose is given in the uh, circle on the right. Here again are some of the technical characteristics of what happens. We use a slightly more expensive leaching agent, but, and this is key, 95% of it is recycled. This means that not only is the process very efficient and cheap, but also environmentally the disposal issues are much less. You've got much less acid left over. Uh, the other things I mentioned, the standard materials, the low cash operating costs, the tailings, limelight and saprolite. So we have a 4,000 meter initial drill program this year, which will start at the end of April, beginning of May, and everything's going well for that. We should have later in the year a jork indicated and inferred resource because we'll be drilling out, infill drilling some of the areas we drilled before. We'll also be drilling the top of the plateau as proof of concept that the mineralization stretches over the whole area. And we'll be doing some ground penetrating radar. We'll also be making some pits. We have a budget for that. Uh, we've, we've spent quite a bit of that already because we uh, pay 60 days in advance of expected uh, need. Direct Nickel will have a demonstration plant up and running in the third quarter. The results will be out late in 2011. And uh, in terms of how we go on from there, looking ahead, we'd obviously either use hydro or geothermal if we could. Uh, the Lahir mine in Papua New Guinea uses geothermal, so there's an established precedent for that. We've got some potentially very good geothermal ground near us, which we've pegged. This shows the general area of exploration. Everything in red is over 20 degree slope and is not uh, the, the prime target. We'd really be looking, ideally, for less than 20 degree slope. You can see the old holes shown there that we, we drilled. Uh, this is a, a close-up view of the drill areas for 2011. The old holes that you saw as that very close pattern of red dots in the previous slide are now spread right out. And you can see that what we're doing in the area where we drilled before is we're taking the best areas and we're doing much closer space drilling to get a high resource category. And at the same time, creating this road up through the middle, we will be doing wider space drilling up there to test, begin to test those areas on the top of the plateau, where we think, based on the previous ground, ground penetrating radar, that we'll have a much deeper profile, particularly in the saprolite. The next page is the 0.8% mineralization envelope based on the previous drilling. And that homes in even further to the key areas in the area we drilled before. At this stage, I'd like Ed to say a few words about the program this year. I just came from Papua New Guinea in the project uh, two weeks ago. And uh, I'd like to report that everything is on track. Uh, barring logistical problems, we should be starting drilling in at least May. Uh, the interesting thing that I would like to add with the, what uh, Andrew mentioned was when I first joined the uh, Regency that was in 2007, I think. Yeah. You will see that there's only one dot in that uh, somewhere here, just at this speed. And with that dot, include some T speeds that were done as early as the 1960s by many companies which basically look at the property up to 1980s. And they were talking about uh, 400 million tons of nickel resource there or potential at 1% uh, nickel. And by 2008, we did some, as Andrew mentioned, 4,000 meters uh, drill holes, more than about 200 holes. Uh, total meter is about 4,000 meters. And already, I think we are seeing some 100,000 of the 400,000 tons that you were mentioning earlier. So it's a bit... Uh, becoming interesting. I, I just couldn't uh, help getting back there and see really what's going on. I, I'm sorry I'm standing so close to it. I just realized 
that I've got the microphone on me, <laughs> and we're yeah. planning to record this. So I'm hoping you'll actually pick him up. But Ed is yeah. uh, doing a really fantastic, incredible job. He's uh, an engineer, and uh, he worked in the past. Uh, he's taught at universities in the Philippines. He's also, um, he lives in London. He has also advised a number of uh, international agencies and worked with them, including the United Nations. Uh, development program, the EU, and uh, done some work on Kosovo, for example. And uh, he worked at one point in the Ministry of Mines, uh, mining house in Papua New Guinea. So he knows all the people there well. And uh, he, the team we have out there as uh, project manager and uh, Ed as deputy project manager, the project manager from Direct Nickel, they do such a good job we actually sometimes think it can't be so easy. We have to worry so little about what happens there. Everything just gets solved. So anyway, that's what's happening there this year. And uh, we do, ex we, our objective is eventually to get five to seven million tons of nickel proved up in the whole area, which will be absolutely huge. So the potential is a couple of hundred billion dollars worth plus of uh, nickel and cobalt within the area. Nickel and copper in Australia is our next area. I pass that fairly quickly. Uh, we have this uh, greenstone belt in Western Australia, and you can see there uh, the blue is the tenements we started with. We're about to drop quite a lot of that because we discovered it's not worthwhile, and we'll concentrate on the areas that are worthwhile. Um, we uh, Historically, the nickel sulfide and gold mines there, we have... Uh, done some geophysics and done some air core drilling in some of these areas. To our surprise, we came across some very high sulfide in the uh, top blue area, the top area there uh, indicated by the outline, and we've pegged all the ground to the southwest of it, which is the continuation of the trend. That's the junction between the Yilgarn Craton and the uh, uh, Albany Fraser metamorphic terrain, and because in the ground above the bedrock, we are getting sulfides. The potential is there could be mineralized sulfides below that, or the sulfides could be high enough, you could actually have a sulfuric acid plant to serve the mining industry just to the west, uh, which needs sulfuric acid. This is the old uh, drill hole showing the mining intercepts. If you look at it on the presentation on, online, you can actually see the grades, but the sulfides are in the southern holes at the edge there, which is why we got the grant and have extended the geophysics down to the southwest and we'll be doing some more work there. This is the planned trenching and air core drilling that we have for that area covering the new tenements and we will do that at some point this year. But as I say, there is quite high prospects that there could actually be a, an economic sul sulfuric acid uh, project there and uh, we of course hope that along that boundary we would find economic mineralization of base metals. Here you can see very clearly the very black material is the sulfides in the previous drill holes. It's quite distinctive and smells quite distinctive as well. And here you can see it even more clearly. And that's one of our geologists in the background there. The other area in Australia where, which we have is in Queensland, and that is in Bandara. This is a granodiorite pluton. It was a whole mining province. There was a, a book written about it in 1910 because some of the largest mines in Australia in the 19th century uh, were within this area, copper, and uh, they didn't look for gold, but in the south there are two mountains there which are relatively high terrain and they're the areas of best mineralization. They haven't been explored or virtually unexplored this century. All the old workings are very shallow but the southwestern one had a mine next to it in the 1870s with a tall brick chimney, a, sm a copper smelter, and was producing copper and some of the material by the entrance of that has been tested and had five grams gold which would have been uninteresting to them at the time but it's quite interesting now and the copper grades were well over 10%. But in 1910, that mine was closed, didn't proceed. And uh, uh, modern exploration has scratched around the edges looking for copper and gold, but has not been in these two areas. There are other reasons why the area to the northeast hasn't been explored, which I won't go into now. 
but if anyone asks me later, I can tell you. But they relate to personalities. A guy with a gun who appeared every time anyone tried to explore the area claimed that his grandfather had pegged it and it belonged to him in perpetuity. But uh, we seem to have conquered that. We're doing geophysics there as soon as the musterings are uh, over this spring and we'll follow that with exploration on the ground. But by reading through all the old literature, we have two extremely promising areas for copper mineralization where we believe that we ought to hit something at least and there's a pros every prospect you could find something substantial there. That is, shows the middle of the area. This would originally have been high ground where the pluton <laughs> came up as it's eroded away over many millions of years. That high ground has eroded away to a flat center and the baked area around the edge where the rocks were transformed by the heat coming up with this intrusion is what's now the high ground around the edges. And it's that high ground where what flowed down here now is that we would be looking for the copper and other mineralization that settled out as temperature pressure conditions changed. That is the drill program we have for later this year. We have a third area which we call mining finance and technology which really reflects the fact that since Regency listed we have helped some other companies get listed and taken stakes and made profits out of that, reflecting the fact that our backgrounds aren't just in mining but also in fund management and corporate finance. And uh, one of them was Red Rock Resources, which we have still 20% of and which is now a near 100 million pound company. Uh, we've also, at the end of last year, made an investment in Oracle Coalfields, which is now worth considerably more. Oracle should be moving up to AIM in the next month. Uh, I saw them just a day or two ago. They have a coal project in Pakistan. The bankable feasibility will be finished in June, and we expect it to be finished in June. And uh, they have a good team of advisors. When they go into production, they'll be the biggest coal producer in Pakistan. That's lignite coal. But we also really like the management. We think that has a great potential to grow. And that as soon as it's on aim, its ability to raise money will be greater. We have the right to raise our stake to 20% in that at the time of listing on aim. And uh, we will certainly look at that possibility. But uh, this is a big game, just as Mambari were playing the big game. If that technology works, it's a disruptive technology. It changes the industry. We become huge. If Mambari is proven to have a resource, it's going to be a huge resource eventually. And if Oracle works, that's going to be big. There's no point at all taking small bets, because if they come off, you've done just the same amount of work as if you took a big bet. And in Alba Mineral Resources, we have, I'm afraid, a small bet, but that's because it, this happened early in our history. And uh, that's an AIM-listed company. Maybe the cleanest shell on AIM, if I can do a little bit of advertising there. <laughs> so if anyone has any ideas, um, we'd be quite interested. And uh, our stake in direct nickel is $6 million. We're the largest shareholder apart from the management. And uh, we uh, would therefore think it's worthwhile because they plan to get listed later this year uh, and probably after they've completed the demonstration plant. Uh, it's probably worthwhile showing one or two slides from their presentation in, at Mines and Money Hong Kong this year. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to get through them very quickly. Otherwise, there'll be no time for questions. But here they are. A dream list of features, I like that. That's a thing that uh, private companies can write that we have to be more careful about. Uh, but it does make quite clearly the point that there's a lot of science behind this. There's a lot of backing. It's uh, not a new technology. It's been around for many years. It's got a lot of patent protection. And we're now at the last stage. So this demonstration this year, this year is absolutely key. And here they refer to our Oro Nickel, our uh, Mambari project, where they say quite correctly, potentially very large, five to seven million tons of contained nickel. And you know the price of nickel is over $20,000 a ton. And uh, of course, you have cobalt with it. So 
you can see the potential value of that resource. And uh, when you look at, Mamba uh, at Regency, you look at the value of our listed holdings plus the value of our stake in direct nickel, which will be listed later this year, is over 20 million pounds, which means with a market value of 26 million, you're paying 5 million for all the rest, or slightly less than a bit over 4 million pounds. Now, as with anything in the exploration market, you can lose some of that money if nothing works. But everything in the exploration market is about you can lose some, but if it works, you have great upside. In this case, the potential upside is very large, in relation to the potential downside, and that I think is the investment argument for Regency. So when people ask me what's going to happen this year, I say to them, well, you know there's going to be this drilling. Uh, the really big things happen at the end of the year or next year, but anything can happen in between because we're looking out for opportunities. But the important thing is, with an opportunity like this, you wouldn't worry about a few months because if you worry about a few months, you may not be with us next year when we hope we shall be much better priced. Thank you. Are the plans to float off Oro Nickel in due course? At the end of this year, if we have the results from the metallurgy and we have a jork resource, the next steps could be very much more expensive. And there will be a strong argument at that point for having them funded through an independent vehicle. There are many different uses for cobalt. You asked what they, what they were because I mentioned cobalt without explaining the uses. You pointed out that you've got some cobalt in your knee, and I think that's the answer. There are many different uses for cobalt. Uh, I'm not an expert on them. The market is not huge, at, and there is the possibility that uh, if uh, some of the projects around the world which produce cobalt as byproducts, one of which, of course, is lateric nickel, come on stream, the cobalt price structure will change, and the price might go down. Uh, what I say is that if that happened, then the demand for cobalt would probably go up as well. So I'm not sure that, that that's uh, too serious a thing. But, but cobalt could potentially be 20% of our value. Uh, that's a really good question. You asked what would prevent the DNI technology working and when will we find if it works. Uh, the answer is the demonstration plant is to demonstrate something we think we know already because the Falcon Bridge former chief technical officer who worked on this in the past at Falcon Bridge is part of the team. Tech Cominco are investors and they've been involved technically. Aka Kverna, Kverna Solutions, uh, Aka Solutions, I mean, uh, have been doing the test work on this. They're the leading recognized laboratory for this sort of thing. And some of the key novel elements, the main one of which is the recycling, have been quite extensively tested and do appear to be robust. What now needs to be done is to put the whole thing together in a demonstration plant uh, at one ton per day volume to prove beyond any doubt that the whole thing works when put together. That's what's being done now. But do we expect any surprises? I think we don't. And also a year or two ago, when we were looking at possibly putting this into a listed vehicle, I think probably prematurely, uh, we had uh, CSA do a, uh, a competent person's report but they subcontracted looking at the technology to another group that again spoke to all the technology people involved, including Acker Solutions, including Falcon Bridge and others, and they wrote a very positive report. Though of course they pointed out that some things were still unproven, there were risks. So when you invest in a company on the market that's in exploration, I mean, as an example I use is, for example, on the TSX and TSX Venture, 1,400 plus companies listed. How many mines are there in Canada? 140. And some companies have more than one. Admittedly, some companies are overseas mines. But the point is that you look at the number of listed companies in the world in mining and how many mines there are, there's a huge disproportion. So when you invest in an exploration company, you're investing in something where if it's green fields exploration, the chances are probably 1%. But here we're looking at a technology that at this advanced stage, you'd have to say the chances it works are considerably better than 50%. I put somewhere between 70 and 95. Uh, I'm asked an interesting question there, which I'll try to summarize, which is, uh, will our price continue on its, 
the trend which you described as being down rather than sideways and go back to where it was? And secondly, uh, would we consider listing in Hong Kong because some companies who have listed there uh, have done very well from the valuations available? You gave the example of a company called Gobi Coal and pointed out that it was valued at a much higher basis than another company in coal that wasn't there. I'd answer those two questions first on uh, the question of whether we can go back down to where we were. If we indeed have investments in listed and unlisted companies, uh, 16, 17 million pounds in, or 18 million in listed, three or four million on top in unlisted, take of over 20 million pounds, it's unlikely we would ever go back down to the price we were before. Uh, and secondly, uh, it, the, the example you gave in relation to Hong Kong is very pertinent because I get a lot of information from China. I've always, since 1979, dealt with China. They are prepared to buy anything connected with coal at the moment. There's huge demand. People will come from China and say, we want to invest in things, but we're only interested in coal. And so something which is A, Gobi, which is Asian, and B, coal, and in Hong Kong, it's quite rational for it to be there. Whether it would be rational for us with something in Papua New Guinea and with nickel to be in, uh, in Hong Kong, I'm not sure. There's definitely very strong recognition of gold, strong recognition of iron ore, strong recognition of coal. I don't think there's, and knowing the Hong Kong market from a fold, I'm not sure whether it has the depth uh, in, of, uh, of knowledge to appreciate our asset, but I may be wrong. We, can, we certainly will always review these things as we go along. We continue to. I'm asked a question of whether we'd put long-term things into Regency Mines, whereas Red Rock, as affiliate company, is in short-term things. And uh, therefore, Red Rock has or is beginning to have an income, whereas with Regency, the income is further away. And whether paying a dividend from Red Rock might accomplish, among other <coughs> objectives, because we've spoken of it, uh, giving Regency an income stream. And the answer to that is, it's the luck of the draw. I think uh, Red Rock happened to be a vehicle that was created to invest in iron ore and manganese. Iron ore and manganese uh, proved to be commodities in high demand where the price went up, where it was possible to do deals and develop those uh, projects, and where we got a good partner in Red Rock. And then to avoid being just a, uh, a investment company, Red Rock went into gold, uh, which seemed an opportune moment. In the case of Regency, Regency was clearly focused from the beginning on base metals, nickel and, and copper. And if you look at the price pattern in nickel, nickel has not had the following wind that iron ore and manganese and gold in the last year or so have had behind them. And you just have to wait sometimes for the cycle. I think uh, nickel is beginning to perform much better and the prospects are quite exceptional for it as they are for copper and as they are for coal. But when we're looking at Regency, uh, I think we are looking at the moment at nickel, one, and uh, coal and copper, two. But those could have a good time and maybe that we get something which is in production or near production sooner rather than later.